Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 19th. How'd that happen? <laughs> 2020. And this is the week and charts. I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here tonight. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If you're watching this on YouTube and you like it, of course, what then like the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I'll get the link up here in the recorded version, which you should be seeing if you're watching the recording, obviously. Also, if you go to DaveLander.com on Thursdays, when I remember, put the link up there. The good news is once you register for the show, you're registered for all of them. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides. Some ADD doesn't kick in. And then when we get to the charts, the live charts, that is, feel free to ask about anything you want. Also, ask about your favorite stock picks, one pick at a time. I think everybody knows that. And then hit enter that way. I don't get lost on what, what I covered and what I have it. I was this morning thinking I really want to talk about psychology, about how trading is a natural. And a little bit of that will come out tonight. But I think it's more important to kind of make hay while the sun shines. And that's what I've been doing in my own trading lately. It's been fantastic with some of these big winners. Now, it's not always like this, I can tell you flat out. And, and if you're newer to trading and you came in and caught a few of these winners, winners, then congratulations. The only thing I would caution you is that it's not always like this. So I want to continue to show you the methodology in action, especially with these recent winners in here. And I think that's important to see how it works, good, bad, and indifferent. And right now, it's it's been pretty good. Before we do all that, there's the disclaimer screen. I also have some thoughts, by the way, on on getting better. And I think that's really important. And that's something that I really want to get deeper and deeper into. And, and it'll make sense towards the end of this presentation before I talk about everything. There was a disclaimer screen earlier. I could sum it up pretty easy. All predictions about the future, a lot of stuff can happen between now. And then I was in a presentation once with Greg Morris and somebody said something as though it was always fact. And he leaned over to me and said, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. This just in. So I ran out of time doing my analysis tonight for IPOs. And I'm talking about being more disciplined towards the end of this presentation. And anyway, when I was doing my nightly analysis, I, I thought I could take a shortcut and just go in and do the FinViz analysis. And I'll show you my FinViz IPO screen in just one second. And I totally missed this IPO because I, FinViz didn't pick it up. It depends on your charting package. It looks like it's not an IPO, but it is. Anyway, I did a buy at B. With IPOs, the pioneer pattern I like to trade is buy at B. And that's where you look to buy on the close of day five, provided that day one doesn't set the high for the week. And I have another example of that in just one second. So day one, day two, day three, day four. And the range isn't fantastic or huge, but it's not bad for an IPO around $15 a share. And then with today's action, the range began to increase a little bit, plus it did a really strong close. So this completes the pattern. So this is a buy on close. And I actually bought it a little bit higher than that. I had to pay up in after hours. I think they were watching me because I'd put in a bid and then they'd up the ask and then they put in a bid and then they'd up the ask. So bastards. <laughs> well, I saw somebody on Facebook said, uh, size doesn't matter until you throw your bid in or something, until you show, until you show your bid or whatever. Anyway. So I just went along that one. Uh, we talked about it a few minutes ago on Facebook, as you guys know, right around the close or right after the close when I saw it. And I noticed that, uh, I think it was John Ross. I guess what I don't know who to give credit to, I'll give it to John Ross, but I think it was John Ross. I'm pretty sure it was, who's here tonight with us. Hey, John. I've mentioned the stock already. So never say never, but my goal in a few of the screen captures, let me show you in a minute, are from either Facebook or for my trading service. But my goal is to never show you anything that I haven't already showed ahead of time. So let's talk about drawdown recovery. And, and one reason I was thinking about the nuances of trend following is it's skewed, meaning that a lot of your winners or a lot of your profits come from a few big winners. And those outliers are key. Early in my career, 
when I wrote an article for Stocks and Commodities, there was a CTA at the time that read the article. And I was thinking about this earlier today. He kind of launched my whole career. He's like, you need to get in touch with Larry Connors because he's looking for somebody to do research with him. And I'm like, I'm not worthy. And then before you knew it, I was working with Larry Connors and doing some programming and market research with him. And that sort of launched my career by accident on the educational side. I was already part of the hedge fund at the moment, but it was early on when uh, Larry Connors picked me up and that was a, a kind of a pivotal moment in my career. Anyway, so along the lines of drawdown recovery, I was thinking how it's been sort of tough, not that long ago, tough in that there was a lot of waiting going on and tough that I, in that I had a lot of prior losses coming into this last little run. And the outliers are key. And, and in talking to this the CTA that I mentioned a little while ago, we were chit-chatting one day and he said, most people try to avoid the outlier as a trend follower. We're seeking out that outlier, that one big trade that makes that really big move. And I'll show you a few of those tonight. So PLTR is one of the stocks that's helping us get out of the drawdown and helping me get out of the drawdown at least. And we talked about this. You can see the Facebook group. And there's a couple of other familiar names in here, such as the first one that Mike's talking about. And we talked about this one last week. So we had five days of trading. The high was set on day one, okay? So if day one's the highest high for the week, and I know I beat the dead horse on this, but I guarantee you I'm gonna get questions on this as soon as somebody watches this video. If high one is the highest high for the first five days, then it not only, ha not only has to close at a new closing high, it also has to close above the day one high. So the day one high rule is in effect on this one. And the thing about buy B is, in most cases, I like to get long on day five, like that one, VRTS, we just talked about today is day five, okay? And if it closes at a new high and the, you don't have to worry about the day one high, and the case was, that was not the case in that one, then I really, really like to get long on day five. And, and I haven't tested it yet or gotten around and tested it, but I, I, I think that'd be some great fodder for research. Go in and see how well these IPOs work with the buy it B pattern on day five, when they trigger on day five, and then I'll, I'll raise that up one notch when day five is on a Friday. That might be that might be the one you're waiting for there. That might be the Mac Daddy. I just have a hunch. So here you can see new closing high, okay? But it did not close above the day one high, okay? In this particular case, the day one high rule is still in effect. Now, if you had a high higher than the day one high, like let's say day two, then you throw out day one as far as the high. So you still pay attention to the close on day one, but you throw out the high. It's no longer relevant as far as this pattern is concerned. John Ross, I brought PT. I know, I know, that's what got me thinking about it. Last week doing this presentation, I was talking about PLTR, this same chart here. And I'm following up on it tonight. And John bought it doing after hours when he mentioned it in the show. So kudos to you, John, for uh, not that you want to buy every stock I, I talk about, but kudos for you for uh, putting that capital in harm's way. And in, in this case, it paid off, knock on wood. So it continues to meander. Now, the point I was going to make earlier, but I got a little sidetracked, is that ideally, again, we want to see this trigger on day five. And I'd be willing to bet that day five on a Friday, again, would be the Mac Daddy. But this pattern is still very much relevant, even if you don't get a trigger really early in the process. So here we are, one month and change into trading. And I've seen this actually work several months into trading. Now, my intent when designing this or discovering this, I should say, after looking at thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of IPOs was to get in as early as possible, sometimes around day five, ob obviously, or um, let me rewind that, sometimes around day five, ideally, or within the first couple of weeks of trading. But here we are a few months into trading. And I've actually seen one, I think, a year later trigger 
and it still worked out pretty darn good, which is kind of cool. Not that they always work out. So anyway, I ended up buying market on close. It rallies up big the next day, which is fantastic. By the way, anybody know what, let's say November 5th, that was not a Friday, was it? Okay. So that'd have been interesting to see if that was a Friday. Day six, I think the six was a Friday. And you could see there's the orders right there. 1,000 to open and 500 to close the next day. And you can see it kind of came in a couple of days and then it began to rally a little bit. The beauty of taking partial profits is you're never going to be 100% correct in the markets or maybe once or twice in your career, but you're going to kill yourself trying to be that perfect. The markets are a very imperfect place. They're They're driven by emotions. As I often say, and that's something you have to accept, and that's what I've been talking a lot about lately, that acceptance. And like Yogi Berra once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. Well, if markets were perfect, they wouldn't exist. So you have to be willing to operate in this imperfect and, I don't know if this is a word, unconstructed environment where things can often be a little crazy, as you probably know if you've been trading for a day. So you have to be willing to take those partial profits. And then two days later, the stock starts coming in and beginning to question my sanity, wondering if I should have taken 100%. And I'm like, no, I'm going to follow my system. And then we end up with a pretty nice rally, as you can see on this one. So we add up the two points on 500 shares. That gives us 1,000. That's what I was looking for in the first loaf. And then on the remaining shares, you add that up times 500, and that's your open profits of 2150. So 31.45 in less than a week is about 3%. If I could do 3% every week, <laughs> you'd never see my fat ass again. 1% or 2% 2 a day, I think is $188 million a year. So those guys that tell you they, they make 2 to 3% a day, they're making 200 million or 188 million to be more exact to um, I guess a half a billion a year. So uh, you know, go out and buy their system. <laughs> Good luck with that. What was the guy on uh, Kevin Nealon used to do subliminal ma subliminal man? <laughs> yeah, go on buy the systems. Good idea. You lose your ass. <laughs> Stupid waste of money. Anyway, so following up on this one, it's at 1851, or at least was it was when I took the snapshot. So the original entry of 1187, that's 664 times just 300 shares remaining. It should be 500 shares, I think. Ah, that's why it's so low. But hey, you know, 300, that doesn't poke in the eye, right? Initial profit target was here. When that happens, we bring the trailing stop up to break even. And there's nothing to do unless it begins to move in your favor. We don't want to give up this entire profit, which I think if it was 500 shares, it should be it should be over $3,000. We don't want to give up $3,000 in this trade. So what we're going to do is continue to trail that stop higher and then hopefully be in the stock for a long 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 time through the beauty of technical analysis yeah we'll get to that Laurent. so crsr was in the trading service and that's the parameters down there it was what i call a first deep retracement it was also kind of a tko type of move and an ipo and it had a pretty good run it ran from less than 14 all the way to 22 so it doesn't really look like it in this chart but that's a pretty good run and a decent retracement. So the buy was here and you could see it triggered on a bit of a gap and I got in a little bit above that gap. Within a couple of days that it hit the initial profit target, actually it hit the initial profit target on the day before. I don't know why, but for some reason I took it, took profits on the following day and I'll have to go in and look at my notes on that. And that's one thing that's, when I say I don't know why on things, it's like I, in some cases I should know why. In other cases, I think it's okay. And that'll make sense in just a few minutes when we get to certain charts. So in this particular trade, it was 600 shares and rolled out 300 at the IPT. And again, they don't always hit the IPT within a day or two. If they did, you'd never see my fat ass again, right? So about four points on that. That's 11.88 in the first loaf. And nice little rally since then. And just based on the snapshot on 300 shares, you had another 47.34 open. 
So you add all that up. So so far, knock on wood, I'm going to actually knock on wood. 59.22 in open profits or 3%. I like to do things where I can show you relative to around 100K account. That's a good round number. I do that on a hypothetical basis and I actually do it on an actual basis. So I can show you the actual trades as I set up. When you hit the initial profit target, you bring it up to break even. And then you don't do anything until it moves in your favor. And you trail it on less for a one for one basis. So as a general rule, you're kind of one for one on the first loaf, so to speak, the first half of the trade. And then you're a little less than one for one on the remainder. So today I think it went up, I forget what it went up, but it was a couple of bucks. And I think I bumped the stop 150 on it, memory serves. And you can watch the service archives. By the time you're seeing this in video, I'll go ahead and update the service archives and I'll put the link in here, daylander.com slash archives, so you can see where that stop was. So because I was busy working on my slides today, and that's something I need to work on is getting more organized and and maybe setting an alarm, I wasn't able to get my IPO analysis completed on a timely basis. So I thought I would just jump into FinViz, and that's why I ended up buying that IPO in after hours. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately for me, if it doesn't work, but fortunately that VRTS is really, really, really thick. So you can actually trade it in after hours. On a lot of these little IPOs, I like to trade. The spread is going to be kind of crazy in after hours, and it's just not worth it. But this is what the FinViz screen looks like. I just set it to less 90 days for the IPO date in the screener. And there is something very similar in stock charts. For those of you who have stock charts, I just haven't gotten around to using the stock charts version of it. And you can do the same thing. There's a little trick. And I think they actually, because of me asking for it, they actually figured out a way to, you could actually ask for the recent IPOs. And at some point in time, I need to probably do a presentation just on that. And that's how I found this ALGS on this particular day, just by doing this, this quick and dirty FinViz analysis. And what I like about this is at a glance, I can see what's going on. And, and if you've got a pretty good eye, you can see, hey, okay, this one looks pretty good over here. Well, we happen to be long this ALGM now, okay? And then there's another one in there that looks pretty good. I'm not gonna tell you which one it is in case you're not in a trading service. <laughs> I'll give you a hint, it starts with an A. So here's the ALGS, day one, day two, day three. And by the way, let's go back to that FinViz chart for a second. Even though it, it triggered a couple of days early, I don't know why I didn't take it on the day that it triggered. I don't know if I felt like the range wasn't big enough at the time or the volume wasn't good enough. I don't remember why. And I don't know whether it would be feasible for me to figure out why I toss out certain stocks when I do or don't take positions. But maybe I need to figure out why I didn't take it in this particular case if it does look pretty good. And I'll check my notes and see, but I don't remember why I didn't take this trade. Maybe that's something I can improve upon. Day one, day two. So far the high is set on what day? Day one, right? Okay, so let's draw that in. Day three, day four, and day five okay so the new high was set or the high for the week was set on day one okay so we have to not only close at a new closing high we have to close above that high if you notice squint your eyes a little bit day five was actually a new closing high we don't buy on that because day one set the high for the week and you can see it just kind of meandered 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 and then finally begin to take off, okay? In this case, this case, your buy signal would have been on this day. Again, I don't know why I didn't take it. I don't remember why. I don't know if it was negligence or if I had some other reasoning. And I, the other thing I was thinking too is like, don't beat yourself up too much, Dave. There's no way with looking at thousands of IPO charts every night, well, thousands of charts every night, and probably three or 400 at least IPOs of those thousands. So I've been saying to look at 2,000 a night, I guess 2,000 plus another 300 IPOs, plus some more indices and sectors and all. But anyway, 
it would be pretty hard to figure out why I didn't take each one. But a lot of times I could just kind of glance at them and say, okay, it's too thin or the range isn't big enough or whatever. But w whatever reason, I missed it, but I really like this breakout. And it's kind of hard sometimes from a psychological perspective to go in and say, well, I could have gotten this stock two to two points earlier or two points cheaper. It's hard to go in and say, well, I'm just going to pay up two bucks. Well, that's what I did. Because sometimes that's what you have to do. Now, you'll notice a breakout characteristic here. And you're like, if you're just new to me and new to my methodology, like this guy trades breakouts. No, I don't trade breakouts. Breakouts more often than not will fail. And I knew somebody that was successful at it, and they told me they had an 8% successful success rate. 8%. So 98% of the time, they were stopped out in their breakout trades. But they were going in and using really tight stops, and they had a little methodology, and they were okay with being wrong virtually all of the time because every now and then they catch a breakout. IPOs, on the other hand, a little bit hard for the – the flash traders or whatever you want to call them, the quants to get in there and squeeze it up, force a forced entry, force an entry on it, scalp a few points to the upside, a few ticks or whatever, and then dump on the stock, bring it back down or short it and shake you out. Very hard for them to do that and something inefficient like an IPO. And you can see it begins to rally a little bit finally and then I was able to get off half. I think that was today. I was able to uh, squeeze that off. Is that today? Yeah, it was earlier today. Everything's a blur lately, it seems like. And there's a trade, a bunch of little bitty tiny fills, as you can see. But it did work out fairly nicely in this particular case. So got uh, 3.45. I think I was, I'm trying to, again, trying to get 1,000 bucks in the first loaf at least. Okay, 300 shares. So that's a thousand bucks and change. And then the stop at this point is at break even. So the worst we could do, barring overnight gaps, of course, is to break even on the remainder of the trade. So again, here's a post in Facebook group, and I chimed in on some of these. And so a lot of times, by the time I get around to mention an IPO, you guys have already found it, which is fine with me. Okay. <laughs> you know. That's the first thing I, I, I'm starting to do now before we even start my IPO analysis is go in and see what you guys are talking about to make sure I don't miss anything. So here's the ALGM. Now, what happened on day four, as you can see? Well, the day four high was higher than the day one high, okay? So we could toss out the day one rule. Now, as I said last week, this did technically did not trigger on the 4th, okay? But I got a little overzealous, and if you go in and watch the week of charts for that week, I'll show you what the chart looks like intraday and what I was thinking and why I got in a little early. I have gotten in a tiny bit earlier in many cases, or a few cases at least, and gotten paid off very nicely by the close, and sometimes in after hours, my order is hit to exit half of the shares. And so sometimes within an hour or so of these buy at B patterns, I am not only in the money, but taking profits. So I got in a tiny bit early, but luckily I was able to squeeze out half of the profits within two days in the trade. There's the trades down there. You can see I got in at 21.57 and flipped out at 24.70. In this case, I used a limit order, and then the stock came back in, okay, came all the way back to break even, and I got out of the trade. So picked up two points and change, 300 shares, that's 810 bucks, and then on the remainder, I actually squeezed out a small profit because my stop was up a little higher. So that's 126 bucks, and this is 936 bucks, so about a thousand dollars. And you know, this is only a few days in the trade, so based on this model account I'm using here, that's an extra 50 percent a year to your earnings, right? So that's better than the poke in the eye. Obviously, they don't always work this great. ALGM, the one I played initially, got stopped out. It's always a little scary to go back to the well, but hey. If I was seeing the setup for the first time, cover up this little name right here. Would I take this trade? Well, as we say in Fargo, you betcha.
<laughs> Somebody's like, are you from South Dakota? Or was it North Dakota? I'm like, no. No, you say yeah, and you betcha a lot. So I used to at least. I think Fargo, Fargo is, first time I saw it, it was appalled, but then you watch it again. It's the funniest thing ever. Very dark con comedy. Is that, the, what's his, is that a Coen brother movie or who's the, who's the guy who did that? Anybody know? Should make that a trivia question. Anyway, ALGM, you can see this is actually in the portfolio and it triggered and so far we're not doing fantastic on it. In fact, we're still underwater. But I think it has potential. Entry is here, stop is down here. The initial profit target is up here. So there's your trigger. By the end of the day, you're underwater. You're probably thinking, oh boy, here we go again. Oh, geez. <laughs> and then it began to rally a little bit today, better than the poke in the eye, but still underwater. And sometimes you're underwater in a trade for a while. So this is APG. We've been in this one for a while. Way back in June is when it first set up. And you can see it made a first deep retracement. I was thinking about this recently. When I did the IPO course in 2014, I showed the first deep retracement and I wasn't actually trading them then. And I said, it's something that I'd want to see more of and then decide whether or not I want to trade it. And then I didn't even realize, but I've been trading these for quite a while. So six years ago, I discovered the pattern. I liked the pattern. And only in the last couple of years or so, I don't know exactly when, but at some point I flipped the switch and started trading with real money. So entries here, 1220, stop is down here. It's two points. And then of course, two points above it for the IPT. Begins to take off a little bit. It almost got to the initial profit target. In those two days, if you go in and watch the services, and again, I'll put a link in here, you'll probably see me preaching. I'm willing to bet, hey, you know, guys, don't split hairs. Close enough for government work, right? But luckily, within about a week or so, it did get up to that initial profit target. So we get up, stop up to break even, and now we have a free position, so to speak, free, free rolling, as Charlie Kirk calls it, after I showed him the money management. And it hasn't done a tremendous amount since, but it's okay. We did raise the stop a little bit. A lot of backing and filling gave us a little bit of a scare. And now it's it's okay. But here's the thing. Of course, I like stocks to go straight up. It's very exciting, okay? But like the one I just showed you a few minutes ago, sometimes they go straight up, they come right back down. I call them a bottle rocket. I think Trying to think who it is, Peter Brand or somebody. I'm listening to Unknown Market Wizards. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that towards the end. And one of them calls it a popcorn trade. The popcorn kernel pops and then it goes up to the top of the lid and it just comes right back down. So a popcorn trade or a bottle rocket is what I call them when they just take off and come right back in. In a case like this, they consolidate, consolidate, consolidate. Everybody kind of gets used to the prices and then bam, they take off a little bit. As I used to say, the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space and come to find out. Somebody long before me, Mr. Ralph Akampora, has said that, but I say it too. Okay, I have um, half a dozen other trades I want to show you, and I'll just show you those on the live chart due to uh, time constraints. But I did have some random thoughts as I was going live, and as I mentioned a second ago, I just started Unknown Market Wizards. I ordered a hard copy after listening to it for a few minutes. I don't haven't gotten around to or haven't gotten a hard copy yet but so far it's been pretty good and i've really been enjoying it uh, peter brandt was the first one interviewed uh, he especially struck a chord with me with a lot of things that that he says and it's funny it's got me inspired to go back and reread all the other market wizards it's like you you read about trading it learns a little bit you learn a little bit and then 10 years later or 20 years later you go back and reread it once you know how it all really works, okay, not that you have it all figured out because you'll never figure it all out, believe me. But it's kind of like goes back, you go back and listen to it, and, and it's so much more. There's so much more there. Go back and read it, I should say. And one reoccurring theme with these traders so far, I'm about three quarters of the way through listening to it, is that they all work really, really hard at getting better and i borrowed one of the guy's ideas he talks about his his emotional state of being his physical state of being 
as it relates to trading. And those are things that I talk about quite often. And when we talked about drawdowns a few weeks ago, initially at least, there's a there's a, a monetary aspect to it, obviously, but there's also a physical aspect to it in that it, it could make you a little depressed, okay? So there's actually a, a mental aspect to it, I should say, and they talk about your emotional capital. And anyway, I think it's important to learn how to manage your emotional capital. That's something that I'll probably come back and revisit quite a bit in coming months. So along those lines, one of the traders in there, and I forget who, and I'll give him credit next week as we flesh some of these concepts out a little bit, but he started a spreadsheet where he tracks his emotions, and uh, I don't know if FOMO is one of the columns, but I put FOMO in there, and let me see if I have some notes here. So mine has FOMO, and, and uh, I have a question mark on one of them, because like, for instance, what goes under the question mark is, Yesterday or day before, I'm looking at $5,000 in open profits that I really don't want to watch evaporate. So I started trying to figure out a way to not so much hedge it, but maybe roll into an option position, keep it one directional. And I wasn't exactly sure what to do. I came to the realization that the implies were probably too high for me to, to do such a thing. But it was something that is unknown to me. So I put that in a spreadsheet. And just uh, different things like energy, I think, is important. And the gentleman, and I forget who it was, but he had what's called a sugar trade. And a sugar trade might be what I call an S&G trade, something that doesn't necessarily fit the methodology. And you just think, well, I'll just go in and risk a little bit. But it's a slippery slope when you're doing those kind of things. So I, I think I just put FOMO for that column in mind. And I'll, I'll share... I'm not going to show you what's actually in it because you'll probably be thinking, why am I listening to this guy, you know? But I'll show you my columns once I flesh it out a little bit over, over the next couple of weeks. But one thing that it's done already, and I'm only two days into the process, it's really make, made me cognizant of how much better I need to become. And I think if you do the same thing, it's very humbling, by the way, because I've been at this 20-something years, and it's made me cognizant. And again, we're two days in. But it's maybe cognizant of the amount of mistakes I make, things I could do better. And I think the reason I'm telling you this, being so open, is that I think if you did something similar, you're going to find the importance of that. And it's the methodology is important. Don't get me wrong. And it's important to be a good stock picker. But that comes, you know, just look at charts for 20 something years and, you know, look at a couple thousand charts a day and you'll get better at that. What's most important further down the line, I think, is to wrap your head around the psychology in, in the beginning and then further into the, to the process, too. It's it's very important early on because the battles often win within, as you know. But along the lines of, of how can I become better, okay? Well, today, or no, it was yesterday, for instance, I was busy working on something and I got distracted working on what I was working on. And I missed an initial profit target. Now I was able to still get out and get a pretty decent profit. And I'll throw that, that was in CPE. It, it hit the profit target and beyond. And by the time I got out, it was already on the way back down, but I went ahead and got out. And by the end of the day, it actually ended lower. So I missed that initial profit target. So that was a mistake that I made. Would have, could have done better. Now, all I'd have to do is set an alert, or if it's a thin stock or a volatile stock that's kind of spiky, I could have put in a limit order in that particular case. Now, I know sometimes I preach that you can go in and squeeze out a little extra profit sometimes when you're going after that initial profit target by trailing a stop intraday or whatever. But a lot of cases, if you're trading like a go-go IPO stock or or go-go momentum stock, I should say, or an IPO stock or anything kind of thin or spiky, you might want to actually set a limit order and let the market make that decision for you in case you forget. Today, for instance, I lost track of time for my analysis and ended up buying an IPO in after hours, as I just admitted to. So I probably could set an alarm to go off every day about 30 minutes before the close so I could start shifting gears into my closing analysis. I've often thought about doing an IPO service from a selfish standpoint for me, you know, just so I'd be forced to do that. Just like 
just like my trading service forces me to do my analysis and forces me to do a very thorough analysis and as i've said before on a really i don't care if it demonetized shitty day <laughs> you know i might just say i'm gonna go home and have a beer you know and and but having to do a trading service it forces me to do the analysis and a lot of times as i've said before many times i find out the day really wasn't that bad overall i was just maybe focused on a couple of losing trades and I actually found a couple of decent stocks for the following day. And sometimes those stocks turn into really, really nice big winners. And the story I tell at nauseum is kind of a, related to this is when someone said they were going to take a break from the service. They weren't quitting. They just weren't going to follow it for a week or whatever. They would take some time off because they didn't see any new setups in the foreseeable future. And I, I replied. Neither do I. And then that same day, we found two stocks, and those turned out to be two of the biggest winners of the year. Now, if I didn't have to do the service, yeah, I might have gone home, right? And said, ah, the hell with it, you know? And it's kind of interesting, not to last week at Band Camp, you with Peter Brandt, but Peter Brandt, uh, Schwager asked him, why do you bother doing a newsletter? And he says, well, I write it for me. He write, yeah, so it's sort of like the same thing along the same lines, it kind of really struck a chord with me, kind of clicked like, okay, I, I do the same thing with the service. This is what my analysis is, and here you go. It sounds a little vain, I know. I don't know if that's coming out right or not, but I write it for me. So if it, if it works for me, it works for you. If it sucks for me, it sucks for you. <laughs> my apologies, believe me, I'm not trying to. <laughs> I'm trying hard, as hard as I can. Now, as I said earlier, I kind of got a little ahead of myself, but the emotional capital is is very important to track. And I never really thought about tracking it, at least in kind of a somewhat quantifiable way. So I started putting in numbers into that spreadsheet. So I have, um, I think, a column with like process and FOMO, like I said earlier, a question mark, and then I have some notes I put off to the side. I still have my trading journal, which I write a lot in, and I still do my journal pages every morning. So I'm hoping between all this, if I need to go in and see what's what's wrong, when, not if, things begin to go south, I can kind of see what's happening. And the reason I'm telling you about me, 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 is I think that you could do the same thing, and I think that's really going to be beneficial. FOMO is is a big one and i think that's something that i think we most of us at least have to work on and i'm very guilty of that i watch the s p futures all day long and sometimes i feed that slot machine like sakota once said you got a slot machine on your desk you don't want to feed it. and every now and then i probably fire off a trade when I'm, i don't have to and the thing about it is, and this is, again, one thing that, that I thought was kind of interesting, I came up in the Market Wizards, is that if you're playing tennis and you don't do anything, they, they volley the ball over to you, you lose a point or you lose a side or whatever, but you're going to lose a game if you don't hit any balls back. And if you just, the reason I'm saying that is if you're just going to wait and wait and wait when you get that perfect smash shot. But in trading, you don't lose any points while waiting. And I know sometimes it's hard to be patient, but it's kind of interesting. Some of these guys in there, not that I would ever trade like this, but they come in, they come in every day, do all this analysis, all the, this analysis, and they're doing like an event type trading where they're waiting for the event, waiting for the event, waiting for the event, and then they go in and get their piece. They might have one really huge day, provided they're really disciplined, and then they go back to waiting. So that's even more waiting than my stuff, which a lot of times you have a lot of waiting. So that FOMO is hard while you're waiting. And as long as you can look at the chart and say, no, there was nothing for me to do, being honest, obviously, then that waiting is actually a good thing. One of the things, again, I'm kind of gonna, last week at band camp, you, I, I know it's like if I glom onto something that I like, I really glom onto it, but one of the guys, talked about the Navy SEALs and the biggest thing they teach a Navy SEAL, of course they teach them how to shoot, but they also teach them when not to shoot. 
and I'm trying to think of his name. I could see his face. Um, the Navy SEAL who wrote a book, uh, Jocko. Jocko wrote a really good book, and he talks about it, it, some 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 of the stories in the book. Uh, I think it's uh, the leadership book, Extreme Ownership. I think was a book, and I would recommend you definitely listen to that one in audible format. And I think I have both the, the written and the audible, but definitely listen to the audible. It was kind of like, I was almost sweating at a few times listening listening to it when when they're getting ready to shoot a guy, you know, and they can't decide whether to shoot the guy or not. If they don't shoot the guy, the sniper, okay, he's gonna snipe off some of our showed soldiers. If they do shoot him, there's a chance they're shooting the wrong guy. And I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but it really made me think about how important it is sometimes not to shoot. Well, that analogy really applies to trading. All right, we're getting a plethora of comments, okay? Let me uh, go through a few of these and then we'll wrap up the slides and we'll hop into the individual charts. I do wanna show you some of these um, stocks that I wasn't able to get into the slides tonight. Okay, uh, Lawrence says, I have a question for later. If time hedging using option versus futures or CFD, which you don't have in the United States, that's contract for difference, I believe. What are just as high leverage for instrument for trading shares slash indices? As I think I've said quite a bit before, hedging as a general statement, and that's why I wasn't really looking to hedge these positions, although it's possible if there were some cheap puts or relative cheap puts, I may have bought them if I have a really, really big profit. But as a general statement, I very, very, very rarely try to hedge a position. So if you if you spend money on a hedge and your position goes up, your hedge goes down, okay? So you lose money here and the money you're making here is offset by the money you lose in here. So if you buy a hedge and your position goes down and the hedge goes up, you're making money here, but you're losing money here. Now, if your position doesn't do anything, you lose money on your hedge. Then you reset your hedge and you lose money on your hedge. So it's a constant drain on your account. What I was trying to do is roll out in CRSR into options. So I think one account had 400 shares. So I was looking to buy possibly four options and another account was 300 shares. And on those 300 shares alone, I think it was 500 and, or, I'm sorry, like $5,500 open profits. And that just seemed like a lot. So my thinking was if I could buy three or four options, whatever the case may be, and then cash out in the position, take the profits, 100% of the profits on the position, then I still have that options position. Unfortunately, the options were expensive. And what's going to happen is now you have a decay aspect. So those options are just going to erode, 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 erode. So as a general statement, I think hedging is a really bad idea. It's tough to it's tough to get it right, okay? I've been looking at options on the Qs and the SPY, but don't know what strike ex expiration to look for. When you When you are learning options, I would buy in the money options and and this is the can of worms uh lawrence so go in and watch i think we talk about options at the q a daveleonard.com slash members for those who aren't a member and become a member if you're not a member and then go in and watch the q a where we talk about options but when you're learning options look at options at exp like at expiration okay look at options today but then analyze them as they would be at expiration okay so see how much fluff is on that option so if it has an intrinsic of let's say 10 points and they want 12 points for it then there's two points of fluff so you're paying two points for that premium and at expiration if nothing changes you're out two points okay it, at expiration if it goes up two points then you broke even okay so look at your position and then look at it what would happen at expiration on expiration day and then figure out whether that premium is worth it figure out how far you got to go in the money if you have to go deep into the money then you're putting up a lot of money which sort of negates the purpose of buying an option in the first place so on this 
CRSR position, I think it was like $5,000 round numbers. I would have to buy like several thousand dollars worth of options. So for me, it didn't seem worth it. Plus the decay that would occur over the next month would be substantial. So I'm just gonna go ahead for now, you know, check back off and I'm gonna see what it looks like tomorrow, okay? But I'm just gonna have to lick my wounds when it comes down and, and stops me out or be willing to let some of those open profits erode, okay? And then if I'm not stopped out, just hold on and, and power through it. So tough, tough, tough. It's not an easy business. You know, these, these YouTube gurus, the guy that's got an ad right, which way am I pointing? I can't see. I don't know what's gonna do on YouTube. Let's see. Right there, the guy with the ad next to me. <laughs> if he's saying you make 100% on every trade, he's lying. YouTube's gonna demonetize me, I know it. I'm gonna be careful. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I'm not. Okay, all right. CRSR has been buying a bunch of other companies. Nice call, Dave. Thank you, Mark. Well, good. Well, good. You know, and, and right now everybody's into uh, this. Um, so they're kind of acting like a SPOC, which is a special purpose acquisition company. I used to ignore all these acquisition companies and then um, they're like, they were hot this year. Great discussion tonight. Oh, thank you, Dakota. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, I know I'm preaching to the choir and that's why I feel bad. Like, geez, how many times am I going to say these things? But I, I need to hear them again. And I know it's like tonight, I feel like it's all about me, but if I can become better, then I can help you become better. All right, if you're not a member of DaveLandry.com, a gold member, then what are you waiting for? And with that, the Facebook group is free, but you have to be at least a gold member and you can interact with other traders. It's The group is paid for itself for me for sure with all these IPOs we talk about, plus a lot of other potential ideas in there. You can ask for help, you know, Lauren, bring up your, question there and let's talk about hedging let's talk about using options let's talk about this um crsr maybe flip it in options maybe not and we'll go from there and then you can see the signs and signals uh meaning that sometimes i'll throw out an ogre trade i think i threw out beaky yesterday as an ogre trade beaky i remember beaky <laughs> and uh, we were able to squeeze a little bit out on that one not not enough to brag about and then you could follow along sometimes trades like ogres and that was an ogre the beaky was an ogre okay let me shift gears here excuse me and i want to show you a couple of these stocks real real quick and then if you guys want you can start asking about individual stocks and then i want to after that i want to go through the market show you a few things and then um getting hungry let's see let's go here and then we could uh take a look at your stock picks okay so PTVE, this is one we talked about in the Facebook group. I wasn't crazy, crazy, crazy about it, but I finally caved in and ended up buying it. And then it imploded a little bit. This was a, a buy at B. And I think I, I bought, for some reason, I bought on this day as opposed to this day here. And I'll double check that for next week. But it doesn't make a huge difference. But I did, well, I was able to take partial profits up here. Okay, so my stop is at break even. Notice I took a little heat on the trade. Trust me, you're going to take a little heat on the trade. I know a lot of people say, if you're not profitable right away, get out. Well, I hear them and understand what they're saying. But the flip side of that is, if you're trading a trend following methodology and you miss a couple of outliers, okay, then your performance is going to be mediocre at best. And it seems like a lot of trades go against you. I know I showed you a few tonight that have worked just swimmingly, okay, from the get-go, but that's that doesn't always happen. And that's why I was gonna name tonight's presentation and last week's for that matter, these are the ones that we've been waiting for. Now let's take a look at a couple of more of these just real quick. SQZ was another one. Now usually I'm either all in or not, and this is one that I ended up with a small position on. I just thought it was kind of extended over here. And it was a, this was a buy at B. We talked about this one in the group. And then I was able to take partial profits. And, you know, here's here's something that if I was doing this a few days ago, I'd put a question mark in the let's get better column because this thing was up like six points during the day, but then it came back in. Now, I had a small, just a small position left, so I really didn't worry about it too much. 
but another but i thought i've been thinking about that a little bit lately and ironically it's kind of like um you know what's the when the when the student is ready the teacher will appear it's kind of like the the wizard's book they were talking about violation of rules and he was talking about if you have a small position you're violating your rules you're tipping you're not you tip to let it ride and then you could fall into bad behaviors now i didn't do anything wrong with this position but I think if I'd have had a full size position watching a six or seven point of road during the day would have stressed me out more than it did in this particular case. It is what it is. It's best just to leave it alone. But this is one thing that I put in the question mark column or will put in the question mark column. What do you do when you're up like six or seven points in one day? Okay. And some of you like to scale out of a little bit and that's fine. But I think the real money is, is sticking with it longer term. EBC was another one. I was it was I was having a hard time getting excited about banks, but banks were one of the strongest performing sectors recently, and I think I might have gotten in a little bit late on this one. I got in right here, and I did flip out some shares yesterday, if memory serves, and it's pulled back a little bit today, but that's okay so far. So far, it's taken off, and a little bit more, a little less volatile for an IPO. Do I ever exceed 2% risk? I try not to, okay? But one thing, it's an interesting question, John, because one thing that I'm kind of wrapping my head around now is that in letting some of these big winners ride, some of these volatile stocks, like a CRSR, where you're uh, 10 points in the money, or, or what was the one a second ago? SQZ, not as you know small position there, but still 10 points in the money. What could happen is your exposure increases, okay? So say you buy a position, and let's just use round numbers, you put up $5,000 margin, okay, or $5,000 cash, everyone look at it, and that position doubles, okay, well, now you've got $10,000 in that stock. Yeah, it's $5,000 profit, $5,000, but from a net net standpoint, okay, you've got $10,000 on the line, okay? So that's one thing that's, it's a good problem to have, but it's something that, it kind of all hit at once this time where we had a half a dozen or a dozen or even more. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, like 13 trades. And I think 11 out of them are all banging out that profit target and all and knock on wood trending nicely. So it's like that risk is that exposure is expanding. And that's something in that it's, it's this hasn't happened in a while. So it's a good problem to have, but it still has to be managed nonetheless. Okay. C S C R S R or in the video gaming space. Yeah, but uh, they also make, I think they're also making products that, that um, I don't know if I could lift it up on the camera if I have enough, um, I don't know if it'll show. They also do things like a stream deck, which I don't think I can get it high enough. I've got my wire, some of the wires are running through my desk. So, um, which, which is used by the video gaming people, but is really convenient for a lot of other purposes, okay? You're only looking at the options on the index for hedging. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it's gonna be a drain on your account as a general statement. It's gonna be fantastic when things go well and not, I, I do try to get a little cute sometimes. And you know, like I'm looking at my portfolio today and I'm like, hey, look at all those old profits. Look at all those open profits, how smart you are. I was like, oh, huh? hang on there, Dave. Whenever you get a little full of yourself, that's right before you, you do a face plant, okay? So that's when I get to thinking about, you know, how can I, I don't want to use the word hedge, but how can I roll these into options? And I'm also thinking, okay, and this is, I don't know if I'm that good, but on, on some days, uh, let's take a look at the spiders. On some days like this day here, and it, believe me, I, it took me two or three stabs, but it's like, okay, I've got all these open profits. I'm looking fantastic, but I know it's probably going to erode a little bit. And you see these futures start coming in, or spiders, whatever you want to trade. Especially when you get a textbook ogre like this. This is a, what I call an HG7 day, a holy grail seven day. This is the holy grail of all days. You get a day like this, where it starts at the top and ends at the bottom, although it wasn't that easy to trade in today. I go in and short these futures, and it helps to mitigate the losses in my portfolio now sometimes and this is the, the hard part and i haven't figured it out yet and maybe it's another one of those things i figured out you know some of a fat ass again you know i think i've said that enough for tonight 
But if I go in and uh, short the futures or whatever the case may be, buy the futures if I'm heavily short, okay, and that position goes sour, now I've added insult to injury, and what have I done? I have done damage to my emotional capital. So that's a tough thing, and I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm working on it. John says, I get the same thing with the Facebook group. Good, good. That's fantastic. And yeah, a couple of people got their um, got their little feelings hurt because I had to kick them out. Actually, my wife does it. <laughs> I want everybody to be qualified to be there. It's okay to be a beginner. We'll help you out if you are. But for the most part, I'd like to see you qualified by being a member of DaveLandry.com. You kick me out of the group. Why do you do that? <laughs> well, because you're no longer a member. It's a members only club. ATHA, I think we talked about this one earlier. It's triggered here and it immediately began to fail, but I had a fairly loose stop on this one for whatever reason. And luckily it did get up here. Well, for reasons that you have to give them a fairly wide berth, these buy B patterns. And it took off. We got the half loaf off. And now we're in longer term trend following mode, hopefully. Okay. CP, that's another one. And I'll wrap up these. Let's go ahead, uh, go ahead and start asking my individual issues if you don't mind. Yeah, we talked about EBC. Oh, CP. Okay, CP. Yeah, this was a set up a few days ago and we got in around here. I got in a little bit later than my service peeps. And this is one where this is where I'm kind of beating myself up a little bit because I was distracted. I don't know if I was watching a cat video or something political or whatever. And I turned away for a little while and it shot up to here. And by the time I got out, it already it was already on its way back down. But luckily I was able to get the profits out. And then by the end of the day, you can see it sort of failed miserably. Okay. So this was a mistake I did. I think that was just yesterday. Knock on wood, luckily, whatever you want to call it, it came back nicely today. So I would have probably been okay. But I can guarantee that won't always happen. Now, again, not to beat the dead horse in this emotional capital thing, but that really got me thinking about it yesterday. When this turned negative, I'm like, I would really, you know, I wasn't happy it turned negative, right? But I began to think how unhappy I would be and how aggravated I would be had I not taken my partial profits. And then what's worse is this looked like a pretty ugly day yesterday. This thing could have came all the way back down and stop me out. And had that happened, I really would have been very angry about it. So let me make sure this chart is still shared. Okay, let's uh, run to the, mar uh, again, start asking about individual stocks, if there's some you wanna cover. I think we've kind of covered everything in the group, that uh, the group that's here to talk about. All right, we'll start with the NASDAQ since we're here. NASDAQ has some trouble getting through these multiple peaks. Yeah, I've been looking at that one, Dakota. I haven't decided on it just yet. We haven't taken out this close here just yet in the NASDAQ. So I'd like to see us take out this September high or whatever that was. And it just keeps bumping up against these, these tops in here, so to speak. I have a feeling based on internal action and based on action of the P's and quite a few other areas, which we'll take a look at now, I think we're going to get through it, and I think it's going to be fine, but you always need to be a little skeptical, obviously, in this business. The NASDAQ looks okay. We're one day away from all-time highs, one afternoon, possibly. Let's take a look at the P's real quick. S&P 500 looks a little bit better because we did make it to all-time highs. We just kind of pulled back from that. I would prefer if we break out and not look back for a while before pulling back. So I'd like to see the indices get to all-time highs. You know, here's one thing I'm just kind of thinking about as I'm doing this. However, it seems like I make the most amount of money when the market isn't going straight up. And that's a little bit perverse, but you're able to get into CS, CRSRs and what's what's the other one in here? Like PLTR and things like that, that kind of just blast off, even though the market might be blasting higher. So maybe be careful what you wish for, but as far as just looking at this index in and of itself, I like to see a blast higher and not look back for a while. Rusty recently took off to the races, brand new highs a couple days ago, and a decent day today, not too far from all-time highs. So the Rusty has really lagged for a long, long, long time. 
and now it's really gotten its act together and it's right off of all time highs. So that's certainly a good thing. Gold, the commodity, doesn't look fantastic. I've been talking about this quite a bit. It doesn't look like the mother of all shorting opportunities, but it does look like it could be possibly in a downtrend. A few big updates put you back above the moving averages and maybe you'd be okay, like we had back here, but unfortunately came right back below. What's interesting though is the gold stocks, they seem to know something that gold doesn't. They've begun to implode a little bit in here. You can see they're down below the um, bow tie moving averages. And there's plenty of Landry light, meaning the little highs are less than a moving average. So gold, the stocks kind of looks like it's rolling over. Gold, the commodity doesn't look so hot. We have a silver bug that's normally in here. I don't know if she's here tonight, but she always asks about SLV. A little bit of an opening gap reversal there, down below the moving averages. They actually haven't crossed back over, all three of them at least, to the downside. But silver looks sideways at best, and it looks kind of toppy longer term. So this week, you can think about shorting it, but I don't think it's actually set up. I wouldn't personally short it just yet. I'd wait for some more of a setup. Now, as far as the sectors, some of these value areas, such as the banks and energies, have been taken off as of late, and that's pretty exciting. We're long EBC as an IPO. I think we talked about that one in a group. I hope we did. And yeah, I know we did. And then also we're long CPE in the service, so that's a energy in a bank. Let's take a look at those energies real quick. Bam. Decent day in energies. You can see they've been rallying up sharply. Bow ties have crossed over, not from all-time lows, but you can see that she's kind of been selling off, selling off, selling off, kind of a Chinese water torture in here. And now they've begun to take off nicely. I'd rather a bow tie come from all time lows, like back here. Actually, in the energies, I like them to bottom out for like four years and people think we'll never have another energy ever. And maybe that'll happen based on what was said in the debates. Who knows? We'll see. Gary, I can't bring up that one in this chart package, but um, I'll bring it up. I'll bring up uh, the actual Bitcoin in one second. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. Metals overall look pretty good. So the metals are, are doing really well, but gold's not doing so hot. So we could see some setups possibly soon in the metals and maybe the play, not that I would I would do this, but maybe the narrative, that's a word that comes up a lot in the Market Wizards book, would be to be short golds or short the precious metals and long the industrial metals. And that might be something that you guys might want to noodle with and maybe you could do uh, a chart in stock charts and it would be like um, maybe copper divided by gold would be kind of a fun thing to do. I know you want to party with me, right? <laughs> Insurance, that's an area that's been doing really well. Another one of those, I guess you'd call it a value area, but this one's kind of hung in there a little bit better than the banks. What I'd like to see is some of these areas that were previous momentum areas like the biotechs or biotech, I should say the drugs, I'm always a bit of a biotech bull, so I got to be careful, you know, not to not to let that sway my opinion. But drugs are wide and wide and loose too. A few huge updates would would get us out of this range, and that would be a great thing. I wouldn't right now. I think it's it's very important. I wouldn't rush out and buy the whole sector of drugs or whole sector of biotechs, but there are some selected areas like like VRTS. In fact, what I would do is, is you know, your kids aren't that smart anyway, and, and they're kind of a pain in the butt. You know, you, you're gonna waste your money, send them to college. Just take the college fund and put 100% of your money into VRTS. I'm, I'm joking. I'm gonna, somebody's gonna take me out of context. I'm gonna get a lot of trouble one day. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, you don't know me. Uh, retail, wide and loose in here. I like to see it break out the new highs. It looks a little better than some of those other wide and loose areas because it is kind of hanging around those old highs, not far from it. Moving averages are still in uptrend proper order, so that's a good thing or flip back over. The semis is one of those old momentum and now new momentum areas. So, so far so good. When I see something like the semis, which were doing fantastic not that long ago and now doing well again, that gets me a little bit excited, okay? So we could see some more action there soon. TLT is a general statement. It's, I've been looking at this one quite a bit, but there's really nothing to trade here. It's a really choppy downtrend. And now it's back above the moving averages, the both side moving averages. I wouldn't do anything with bonds, but it looks like ultimately, I hate to use the word ultimately, but ultimately it looks like they're headed lower. Okay. So eventually we'll have some higher 
right? So Mark says, heck yeah, I forget what I was saying. <laughs> hey, Dave, MGI, a little more pullback. Okay, uh, let us let let me do this real quick before I forget about it. Let's see if I can get um, that ACP up. In fact, you know what's cool? I wish you could see it, my USB isn't long enough. But I actually have a button that I press called KLAM, which stands for King of All Markets. And when I press that button, it brings up Bitcoin and it brings up Forex and it brings up a bunch of cool markets. So let me just show you this ACP. So we can take a look at, uh, let's see if we could bring up GBTC here. I don't know whether it'll come up or not. Oh, it did, okay, that's cool. So GBTC represents Bitcoin. And just by chance, I have Landry Light down here, 30 EMA Landry Light, okay? And I also have, this is the percent of close, which is the market timing, not really indicator, but just 10% below the close. So you can see Bitcoin versus or basis, the GBTC is doing pretty good in here, a nice trend. In fact, it won't let you in. Now, John Z the other day said, hey, you got a TKO and GBTC. And I was actually looking at the Bitcoin itself, waiting for a TKO type of move. and I wish I'd have, I'd, have, I'd have paid attention to what he said. And John's in the Facebook group. Got a couple of Johns in there. And because I think I might have taken this trade around 1750 or so, and it's already at 20. So that would have been a pretty good trade to take. So wait for the next TKO, wait for the next pullback. Let me take a look at the cryptos in and of themselves. And you can see solid, solid, solid trend. This was not enough TKO move here, okay? But the GPTC actually looked pretty good. So it's still in a trend. I don't know why you get an extra bar in here. I have to ask them what's going on. But wait for a pullback there. While we're in the cryptos, let's take a look at Ethereum. Ethereum looks okay. Bitcoin's the strongest for now. So you might want to wait for a pullback and Bitcoin. Litecoin looks pretty good. I guess Litecoin's actually the strongest. Looks a little bit more volatile though. But yeah, I'm I'm um, waiting patiently for a pullback. What's the old adage? Uh, they don't let you in on the upside and they don't let you out on the downside. <laughs> Seems like. Okay, so that's GBCTC. All right, I'm going to switch back over to. my charting package okay mgi okay it's kind of hard for me to get excited about a money gram but hey look at this this is kind of crazy hv of 104 wow that's crazy it does have a tko but i'd actually like to see a much bigger tko because this thing ran i can measure it i don't have to eyeball it on a closing basis it ran up 200 percent over a fairly quick time fairly so I would like to see maybe a pullback, believe it or not, as deep as six or more on that one, okay? But yeah, good eyes for us trend. CCCC is some one I've been watching. And there's another one, it escapes me at the moment, but there's another one that's even worse than this one. It's just kind of wide and loose. And what I'm wondering is, and, and it, it's, above, it's above $20. We have the $20 rule for the buy at B. But lately I've been a little bit lenient with that and maybe it's more like the $25 rule and kind of fudging a little bit on that. And I'm wondering if this particular IPO and there's another one, if we have a chance, I'll go in and look for it. But I'm wondering if it's gonna make a stealthy closing high like it did right here at 29. And then maybe the next time it makes that stealthy closing high, cause this looks a little bit better than the other one I'm thinking about. It might be worth a shot. Now, I don't like taking little positions, but I, my hand might be forced, you know, pick up a few hundred shares if it closes at a new closing high next time it does. So, yeah, I think you might be on this, that something there. Let me see if I can figure out what that IPO is while I'm waiting for more setups to come in. Uh, Chris, you're next. Or, no, we just did. Uh... Now, the HV wasn't too crazy on that one because uh, Chris was saying the HV is too high on MoneyGram. No, the, the HV isn't too high on that one simply because 
the structure was there, okay? If you have HP and structure, HV and structure, that's a beautiful thing, okay? If you have wide and loose and high HV, you want to avoid those type of stocks. Let me see if I can find that stock for you real quick. So I'll give you an example. And this is something that I'm trying to wrap my head around. I'm like, can it, is there a stealthy pattern here or do I just ignore them? And, you know, I've been thinking lately, it's like, you know, if I start asking all these questions, you're like, well, why am I listening to this guy? And I think the answer is that in order to become better, you have to admit that you don't have all the answers. Then you have to work towards those answers. This is it ALGM? Doesn't that look good? This looks, this, oh my God, look at the stock. Who's got grandkids in here? I, I know somebody's got college friends with grandkids. You know, those grandkids, I, I just don't know about them grandkids. I think you could put their college funds in, into ALGM. <laughs> I'm gonna get his ALGS. That's, that, look, that looks good. Easy for me to say. I don't know if it's no, it's not this one. Let me see if I can find it real quick. There's one that's just a lot of. It's, is it array? No. Well, it escapes you, but I have a feeling, and I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up on. I'll find it for you tomorrow. I promise. And I'll bring it up in the Facebook group. But there's one that I just just keeps catching my eye, and I'm like, you know what? I might just have to buy that a new closing high. And CCCC is one that's 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 similar to that. Let me just go back to the MGI for a second for Chris. This is what I'm talking about, okay? HV, yeah, it's a 104, but it's HV with structure. Look how persistent this is. Look how accelerating it is. Now, I do want to see a deep, deep, deep pullback to knock as many people out. It's got to scare some people out, okay? Think of the psychology behind this. Anybody who was long two days ago is happy. Anybody who bought that high is getting nervous, okay? You want those nervous Nellies to get shaken out first, okay? You want some of the long-term holders to get shaken out, and then you want to come back in for when it pops back up. You got plenty of volume. You might have, you probably have some institutional sponsorship on this stock. So if this thing gets whacked pretty hard, they might look to window dress and buy it. I don't want to try to make a system just based on that, but it is kind of a, an argument that might actually work. John R wants to take a look at DYN. Well, I would wait for, you definitely want to wait for a new closing high, but yeah, it's got okay volume. Sure, put that on your radar, and that would be okay if it, if it closed above a new closing high. It did do the new closing high here, okay? So technically, that would have been your buy, but it just really didn't do a whole lot just yet. So yeah, that next buy, and you know, looking at that ALGS, I'm wondering if, there's something to these buy it bees if they break out with a little bit of vigor, like that ALGS did, which was the first closing high wasn't really that fantastic, but then the next closing high was was on an expansion of range. So that's that might be a little bit more fodder for research too. CD for Dakota. Yeah, CD looks good, and this is this is kind of that stealthy thing. I was talking about not quite past the day one high, but yeah, absolutely. Put that on your radar. Anybody know what they do or can you look them up? Is it related to your industry? By the way, anything, you don't have to say it tonight. You can bring it up tomorrow in the group, but think about it overnight. Um, if there's anything related to your industry, please let us know tomorrow. Chinese software, huh? This, we're looking to buy a Chinese stock tonight. Any software? Yeah, this looks pretty good. Definitely put that on your radar for sure. And remind everybody tomorrow if you don't mind. DNLI. Yeah, this looks pretty good. This is a uh, okay volatility and it's got structure. Now, my only concern is that it could be priced for perfection. Okay, I would much rather something like this where you could put. Is it is that the one? Which one is it? Uh, VTRS maybe. VTRS. Well, that's not a perfect example, but it's just getting started. Okay, it's an IPO. It's just getting started. This is what you're gonna put your grandkids' college fund in. Okay, the DNLI looks good, but it's really extended. It might be priced for perfection at these kind of nosebleed levels. 
So what I would do is make sure you have a really good knockout move, a really good deep retracement. Make sure a lot of people get taken out of it before you go to trade it. Yeah, it's it's probably I'm a minimalist, but I want to see some serious pullback. A R R Y. Yeah, that's one we've been looking at quite a bit. Um, I can't I can't get in. I can't buy it at a buy at B. Be just because of the price and all, but let's see what the volume's looking like. It's got a pretty good volume, okay. And it did have kind of a first deep retracement, like back here looked pretty good. And that that might have been a retracement worth trading. I, for some reason, I couldn't get excited about it. So I think what I'd do with this one is I'd wait for I'd wait for a break to new highs and then look to play a pullback, okay. All right, any more? We're, we've got a little time left. Well, while we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. Oh, no show next week. Okay, we've got a few coming in. I'll get those, and then we'll finish up. No show next week. It's Thanksgiving. Everybody in the States, happy Thanksgiving. Laurent, what do you all do on Thursdays, <laughs> on the third Thursday in, uh, in Australia? You do anything? It's a... Uh, Kangaroo day. I ate some kangaroo once. It was actually pretty good. It was hopping off my plate. <laughs> uh, my host for the, uh, I was down there speaking at a conference for the Australian Technical Analysis Association. And uh, my host is like, she said, get the kangaroo. It's good. I'm like, yeah, right. You know, and she's like, no, I'll get it too. And it was actually the best meal that I, uh, I had while I was down there. Um, this is something that I wouldn't buy. I don't like this gap down here. So this would have to make new highs trend and keep on trending. And I look for a pullback. So, uh, Gary, put that on your momentum list possibly, but I would wait for a breakout and a pullback. Great class, Dave, as always. David. Thank you, David. Snake season, but we don't have bears and cougars and boogers. <laughs> We got a cougar. We got a cougar right there in the house. <laughs> David, <laughs> watch the show alone. Oh, is it alone in Australia? I, uh, I watched some of it. You know, it, it sort of stressed me out. I was watching one of them. I was getting stressed out. I forget what they were doing. They were eating an animal raw or something, and or they open it. Ah, it's gonna. <laughs> I can't. I, can't. I remember what it is now. <laughs> it almost. I can't say they. Ugh. <laughs> I can't, I can't think about it. Uh, that's when I stopped watching. There was one of them that made me sick, uh, or nearly sick. Okay, let me get that out of my head. Uh, NBCR, nah, it's too many days of the pullback. You know, I'm, I've been able to find decent setups lately, so now I can go back to kind of picky mode. Okay, if you have a bunch of bunch of days in a setup in an IPO, it's okay, but um, <laughs> not in. A, uh, uh, I can't. Uh, Whew. Oh. Wow, look at that. Tiny Elvis just jumped out of me. Look at that. Look at that stock. It's huge. <laughs> yeah, this is just too crazy. I mean, you know, what do you do now? You know, it just jumped uh, 30% overnight. So, you know, maybe keep it in your longer term watch list. All right, Lawrence going to be trading down in Australia. Do you eat snakes? I've eaten snake before. Snake's uh, pretty good, but it's bony. Rattlesnake. I'll pretty, eat pretty much anything. Uh, mountain oysters are pretty good. Every now and then you get one that's grisly, though. Ugh, it's going to make me gag again. Uh, this looks a little crazy. This is what I call a bottle rocket. You know, it shot up 400% 4 overnight, and then they kind of go, and they come back in. So I would leave that one alone. <laughs> I. I <laughs> oh man she got it it's the one with the porcupine that's all you need to know i can't watch it anymore because i'm worried they could have another one like that exactly missed it fomo yeah you know you can't kiss all the women you know as i say or men whatever you're into but if you're into both i guess you're a greedy bastard g tech stole that line from uh what's his name Jen dennis miller Oh, for your friend Wayne watching the recording. Yeah, uh, Wayne, it's a uh, it's a what I call a bottle rocket. You know, a bottle rocket. If you're not a redneck, a bottle rocket is a little thing. You light it, it's, it's kind of exciting, and then it doesn't do much. It just comes fizzles out. Okay. 
Return to Paradise. Yeah, okay, I hear what you're saying. Um, I haven't really seen a lot of those work lately, but you know, it might be work worth watching. Um, and I'll forget who brought who started the the pattern. Was it you, John? John Ross or John Z? Talked about a pattern where the stock shoots up and then it comes down and bases out and shoots up again. Okay, it was John Ross. Okay, it was you, John? Cool. Yeah, it's been a cool pattern. It just hasn't. I haven't seen them working lately. Okay, so we'll pay attention to that for that pattern. I wouldn't buy it now. What he's saying is you get them shoot up, then they come down. And a while back, I was experimenting with this one. If you go back and into the, the longer term, uh, go back long, uh, earlier this year. God, it seems like this year has been the longest year ever. Oh, but uh, go back earlier this year. We talked about the return to paradise uh, pattern quite a bit. If you're on Facebook, just Google RTP in the group or return to paradise. So APHA. uh chew wide and loose let it break out and then we'll figure out what to do with it okay but yeah it's too wide and loose for now i don't know what you would do with this stock no structure okay i'm going to go ahead and wrap things up i want to thank everybody again no show again next week everybody enjoy your thanksgiving Laurent, enjoy your snake or whatever you're eating on uh celebrating our holiday <laughs> or happy trading i should say if you're doing those cfds Everybody, again, have a great Thanksgiving, and I'll see you guys and girls in a couple of weeks. Thank you guys so much. Oh, you're welcome. Happy Thanksgiving to you, too, Brian and, and John. Thank you so much. I feel like we're out for him. And Lauren and John. <laughs>